So I had one of my clients ask me to not only shoot this empty, blank, barren lot of land, but also what it would look like if we placed this house on top of it. And this is something that I wanna show in this episode from a number of different views. One, I wanna show what technically was done behind the scene and the editing that was involved with it to get that to come out so that we have what looks like a render. It's more of a concept image. But more importantly on top of this too, as we walk through this episode, I wanna explain the business opportunity because going out and shooting a lot like this, maybe 150, 200 bucks to just run out there and shoot that real quick. But this turned into a much more lucrative shoot just by editing this one image. So without further ado, let's dive into this. Let's get started. So here we can see one of the finished images that was delivered. This right here was the other one. Here in Photoshop, all this was done by starting with just this photo here. So this was an area that was burned down during one of the most famous wildfires here in Southern California, the Thomas Fire, and a lot of these lots were just leveled right to the ground. So they did have some drawings that, of a house that could be put on here, but they didn't want to finish the build. They decided to move out of state. Long story short, anyways, we needed to be able to show what this could look like so that potential buyers could see that, well, we've already got plans drawn up to take this empty lot and to turn it into something like this. Now the plans for this, just to show you what we based this off of before I show you how this was actually put together, they really weren't that much detailed. In fact, it was just from a PDF file and this is all that I could get out of the PDF to do a screen capture. It's a very rough drawing. There's not much that I can do with this to put this on the plot of land. It really doesn't look good. The uh, designer and architect was calling this a render. I really wouldn't call that that much of a render that's more of a hand drawing. Anyways, let's get started into how this was put together. So let's start with the base image and you'll see here then that I have a lot of different groups of what was done. So the first thing I did was an original edit. And you can see here, this isn't exactly everything that was done at the end, but it got us close. And the key to this are all these layers. And in particular, what I was able to do is take that empty lot and then take and put this house on it. So that house was generated using Adobe's Firefly, but using a structure reference. Let me show how that was done. Before getting into that, know that Firefly is only gonna produce something that's about 3000 by 2000 pixels wide. So that's what I resized this to, so that the image would be 3000 pixels wide. And that way I know I'm gonna retain a good high resolution. Something else to note is that yes, there is a lot of editing that went on in here, but this is where there's a lot of missed opportunities if you're outsourcing your editing. If you learn how to do editing, you can expand and grow into other areas of real estate photography and not just be running around from house to house to house doing, for instance, run and gun HDR. You learn how to do stuff like this and you can sit back at home making a lot more money. Once again, turn this into a $600 shoot just for one photo. And this is something that I talk about, by the way, in my course on business and marketing for real estate photography, where you can explore different areas of real estate photography and make a lot more money, but knowing how to do the editing is key. So once again, we started with this image and then we put this house on top of it. If we take a look, this is what it originally looked like and that came out of Firefly. To generate this out of Firefly to look something like our reference image that we had, what I did was in Firefly, I typed a very simple prompt, a modern single story house, white with black trim, flat roof. But the key here is that I used a structure reference. And if you'll notice here, the structure reference that I used when I clicked on here, that was this structure reference down here. It was just that very simple rough drawing. That's all that was needed for Adobe's Firefly to come up with some ideas. Now, what I ended up doing was generating this quite a number of times. And you can see here's different variations of downloads that I did so I could at least get some pieces too of what I might like and what I might wanna start with, what I can add to it. This was one of the primary images that was then used when I was working in Photoshop. So I'm able to take that image, be able to select that and then mask out everything else. 
Then I need to put in some of the other things here for the yard. Now you'll notice if we go to the finished image, there's a lot of stuff that was added in here for the grass. You can see all the wood slats on the doors, all this stuff, but we'll just turn that off for now. Take a look at this step by step. So up above here, you'll see these various layers where, for instance, I'm adding some grass over here. I'm then doing something here to add a little bit more of the grass and an even uh, railing down here for a, like a, a small fence area. And also then over here onto the side. And each one of these I had done in sequential order by using then generative fill. So you can see here, if I go to the properties, I put in generative fill, green grass mode and well manicured. And that was after I had drawn a polygon. So for instance, if I were to start this fresh, I'd go above this layer and I would draw some type of a polygon around this grassy area. And I could keep it kind of rough and I'll just do that for now, just to get this area. I'll overlap just a little bit. And when I do, then I can just go up to edit and then generative fill, and then I could type what I want. I can say a green grass and let's say a uh, mode. And so it doesn't have large grass and uh, manicured nicely, like nicely manicured. Then when I click generate and just let it go do its thing, it's gonna give me a few different options. I may wanna use one, I may wanna use more, I may wanna generate this again and maybe refine some of the wording as well. But when it's done generating, then I have a variety of different things to use. And none of these are really to my liking for this. But if we take a look at the original one that I did, you can see that it also took a number of tries. One of the original ones was this. I didn't like that. I just said grass and plants. Well, that didn't work out very well. Another one I did here was green grass mode and well manicured. And eventually running that a few more times, I got this. So that's all that it is for adding some of these other things. The same goes for adding this down here. If we take a look at the properties of generative fill, that was a tiered white stone retaining wall. And it got me something fairly close. There were some other weird things that came up with it that very typical of generative fill. But you do that enough times and then you start getting other stuff. The same way when we take a look at trying to get this grass over here and then something here was for the driveway. So here to get this nicer driveway to have something to at least start with, that's where then in generative fill, I typed in a concrete driveway. It gave me a few different things things, whatever. And that was from drawing a polygon around the area for the driveway and doing this generative fill. Then the key is once I get close with a lot of this stuff, I'll start stamping the layer. And you've probably seen me stamp layers before doing the uh, shift control alt E or command option shift E if you're on a Mac. But once you have that stamp layer, that's when I'm able to do some cloning. So traditional stuff that I would do on here to really clean this up. You can't rely on generative fill and AI to do everything. You still need to be able to use some of the tools like I've shown throughout my editing course and I've shown throughout videos here as well. So once that's in place and I've got this, it's looking pretty close, then I can add some other stuff. For instance, here I changed the door. And what was the door that I changed out here from having it like this to this? Well, that was me just drawing a polygon and having that then with a generative fill so that this is basically the layer that I got. And that was, when I worded it, was just a front door with full length windows on either side of the front door. And this got me close enough. There were some really weird things and that might not be so bad, although there's front door might be over here, can't really tell, a few different variations. But what I eventually settled on, I really liked this, it did look good and it got me a good starting point. So that got me this original edit. And now this is key. This is where I can take this and just send this in its original draft form like this to the client and go, are we on the right track here? Is this something that I should be doing? Now remember, these type of edits, as I've talked about in my business and marketing course for real estate photography, this is something that you charge by the hour for. So the more iterations you do, for one, you're not gonna spend too much time and overcharge the client, but also you can take your time and do it right. Let them get back to you on this. So the one thing that the client wanted to do was to definitely change the roof. And so what I did here was I took another image here that had a better roof. 
And then I was able to take that with this image and then take those segments out of that other image and start placing that in there. And that's done by just selecting those areas. So going in here and wanting to select, for instance, the roof, I could just use a polygon tool and go in here, say I want this part of the roof and that's all I want. I can do control C to copy that. And then when I'm up above here, I can then just paste that. Now I've got this other layer and I can then warp that into place however I want to, just like you were doing anything else. For instance, if you've never done the warping here, like for uh, TV swaps or whatnot, I would just go to the edit menu, then go down to transform, and then maybe to warp, or in this case, I would do a distort. And here then, just drag some of the corners, you get it into place, you kind of futz around with that as you want to. But then when I had that one done, that's where I start seeing these other layers start coming in, where I'm able to then put in these various pieces from that other image. So that was from taking then another one of those images that I generated out of Firefly and just using pieces out of it so that I could paste those on there. So I send this to the client. That's the next step. So that's the next iteration. Client loved it. Two things that she wanted to have done though, she wanted to have wood slats, more of a mid-century modern look, on the chimney, underneath of the awnings, on the front door, and on the garage door. So that's where the rest of this came in. So for instance, the chimney slats. What I was able to do is take this image and just use this to once again copy, paste, and then distort into place. This was just generated out of Firefly asking for wood slats in a mid-century modern look on a wall. And so once I have that then, I can copy and paste these various pieces here. You can see there was one for each side that I did. And then when I change the hue and saturation to it, then I get something that's a little better on the color here. But you'll notice that there is a clipping mask applied to this hue saturation layer. So if I didn't have that, it would be desaturating everything. But I did that because the wood just looked a little too rich. So I just wanted to desaturate that a little bit on this particular layer. When I had this layer, which was these other two layers kind of stamped together and then edited, now I'm able to desaturate that just a little bit. Okay, so now I've got my chimney slats. That's looking pretty good, just like the client wanted, but now I also need to do the garage door. So I did something very similar where I used image of a garage door generated by Firefly. I just shrunk that down, I put that into place, and then I was able to warp some of that into place and then add a couple other adjustment layers with clipping masks to change the hue saturation and the brightness. Using pieces of that, I've got the garage door, I've got the chimney, also a similar thing was then done for the front door where I've got some wood slats on a front door and I've got the hue saturation layer. And this was done from this image that was generated from Firefly. And then just copy this area just by using that polygon tool and then pasting it as a new layer. And that's all that that front door layer is down here. Now, after doing this then, I wanted to do some other final touches. So if we look at the under roof here, I wanted to add some color. So I just added a color adjustment layer here. This layer is in color mode. And then I just added a few other things here. I wanted to change this into a better looking window. So this is a generative fill layer with a full length window after drawing a polygon around that area. Same way then for improving the sidewalk, I did a few renditions of that, eventually desaturated it, and then I wanted to add some better shrubbery down here, and then overall just increase the brightness. So this gets me now basically a finished image, and yes, that was a lot of work. That was four hours of editing. But four hours of editing, depending on how you charge, that's anywhere from $200 to $400 to make this image. And then of course there was just one other variation that I did where we took this and I just changed some of the height. So she wanted something that was a little bit more shrunken down. There were then some touch-ups that went here, stamping that together to do some cloning, and then just a few other touch-ups in here. So this then was the final image that they did approve but it all started by just taking this blank lot that we went out and shot and then using this reference image, 
putting that into Firefly and then getting us something to start with. And then after all the edits, we have something like this that we can then present to the client. Now, yes, it is a lot of work, but you can charge for it. And if you can learn how to do your own editing and you practice and you work on doing stuff like this, then you can expand your services so that you're the person that is called no matter what the job is and no matter how difficult it is, you'll show that you have the professionalism and the expertise and skills to be able to do any type of real estate photography.